my podcast on real relationships. My name is Sophie Poisson and I am a relationship expert, international speaker and best-selling author of a book, You Have a Half. I decided to start this podcast because in my opinion, relationships are currently not being portrayed as what they really are. Whether you're watching the news, TV, on social media, the perception given to people is wrong. And my aim is to talk about what happens in the real world, talk about real stories and listen to what real people think, do or go through as opposed to creating expectations of something that doesn't actually exist. I may not agree that with everything that is said by my guests, but it is their chance to express their opinions and their stories. So here today, we have Mary Runnan, and we're going to talk about how being an extrovert or an introvert can affect your relationships. Hi, Mary. Hello, Sophie. How are you? Oh, very well, thank you. Yes, the sun's shining. <laughs> always makes me feel better <laughs> exactly so can you tell us a little bit about yourself please yes yes so um i'm sort of starting from the point of our subject um when i was little i was um a middle child but my sister was eight years older than me so she was quite grown up when i was growing up and my brother was only two and a half years younger so we were sort of brought up together um but i spent a lot of time by myself and i loved reading and i loved books and being by myself and people used to say I was quiet and shy and um, whether that was true or not I'm not sure but just recently I've been thinking an awful lot about introverts and extroverts so it's interesting and, and now I do a lot of speaking I you know I give talks in person and I do a lot of things like this we're doing together and speak to people but I realize now I actually I am more on the introvert side of things so before we carry on, what would you describe as an introvert and what would you describe as an extrovert? Mm, well, the thing that made the big difference to me, I think it was Susan Cain's book, um, Quiet, which I always forget the subtitle, but it's something along um, being heard in a world that won't stop shouting, something like that. So I should have looked it up beforehand, but it's something like that. But the distinction that I learned from that was that people who tend to be introverts recharge their energy by going away by themselves quietly so you might have to read a book or go for a walk by yourself or go out in the garden and people who are extroverts more likely to recharge their energy by being with lots of people and getting that buzz and the fun and the enjoyment of you know playing team sports or being out at a party or that sort of thing it doesn't mean that either side doesn't enjoy both those pastimes as well it's just a, a core of distinction which really helped me yeah i think that the, the thing as well is that you can change because if I look at myself I was probably I was raised as an only child and obviously both parents were working so I suppose straight away you know you haven't got someone with you uh, whether I was born an introvert or not I don't know but I was and a lot of people who've known me through my corporate career would not believe that for a second because I did become an extrovert and I found that over the last sort of five years I can be both but I'm certainly more turning back towards being an introvert, especially if I'm in a room full of, you know, full of exuberant people. I won't try to take over, shall we say, and scream louder than they do. I really retreat in that sort of case. But yes, if no one is the extrovert, I might be it, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes, exactly. That's really funny you say that because I was reminded the other day actually in a conversation some time ago I was being made redundant from one of my jobs. It's happened three times now. This was the first time. And I went to two job interviews on two days running. So I didn't get feedback from the first one until after I'd done them both. And they are both within the NHS because that's where I was working at the time, non-clinical position. And they both did these um, assessment centres where you looked at as a group and observed and given tasks to do and all those things. When I did get the feedback, the feedback from the first day that I was very quiet and didn't participate very much and let everybody else do things. And the feedback from the second day that I was far too bossy and took over and told everybody what to do. And it's exactly as you've described. The first group seemed very well organised. Somebody yeah. was a natural leader. We all agreed tasks. I did my part, but I, you know, I did what I was told, basically. And the second group, nobody seemed to have any idea what we should do. So I suggested something and took the lead. Yeah. <laughs> the same thing. And this is the thing, I think something that we forget is the people around us that change the way we react to them, basically. That's all it is. But why do you think it's so important in relationships you understand the other person's type? I mean, I've got an example, but I'll let you answer it first. Okay. Um, it's, it's about communication. It's about 
anything in relationships, everything in relationships actually is about communication. So if you have very different styles, and sometimes it's a male-female thing, it's, the styles can be very different, and understanding that is a big um, hurdle sometimes to get through, and a big breakthrough when you do, and you just realise that when, what they're saying doesn't mean what you may think it means, it means what they, may, they think it means, and it's, it's all those sort of things. It means um, what they meant. <laughs> it means what they meant, that's right, so you know. And it often is a male female thing but not always is it? it's about the, the way people speak and often it is because we're speaking a different language it's not because we don't want to communicate well or we don't love each other in that sort of sense it's, it's that we just don't know how to communicate in a way that the other person can understand and vice versa it works both ways um, so I think it's really important um, and it's interesting again what, what you said about your experience and what I said about mine you know often people can perceive themselves as see others sorry as, as different to themselves when actually they don't themselves so just very recently when i've been writing my book in the it's called the powerful voice of the quiet ones mm -hmm. the subtitle is reflections on an introvert's life um but i went to new zealand recently when my sister emigrated years ago to visit her and her family and i was giving a talk there and when she watched the recording of the talk and we were discussing it, which we'd never done before, mm -hmm. um, you know, I said, well, I've always seen you as an extrovert because you were always my big, glamorous, successful older sister. I wanted to emulate you. Mm -hmm. She said, well, I'm really, I'm an introvert. You know, I really do want to be quiet and go away and recharge. And exactly like that, just that she operates in the world, as you said, mm -hmm. by being that way. And you have to be. And the, the world of work is set up for extroverts at the moment, basically. Yeah isn't it open plan offices big meetings you know always on with social media or emails or whatever it is phones in work situation and that's overload very often for somebody who feels they need that quiet time yeah and i think that i mean the example i was going to mention is someone i know who um i don't quite well he's definitely an introvert without a shadow of a doubt he's got together with a, a, a proper extrovert and when it all started, the, the, the questioning of the things he was going through was that he was boring and maybe he wasn't enough and he should change, which he did do to start off with. And he started going out more and doing things that he was like, no, I'm really enjoying this. And I'm thinking that won't last. Um, and, you know, where I'm going with this is that, you know, um, the truth is that what he enjoys doing is playing on his computer 10 hours a day if he's got a choice and what she enjoys doing is going to a pub or, you know, a party or whatever. So that's led to a number of arguments and these arguments have not been helpful nor healthy because we've not been handled properly. And it goes back to self-acceptance, isn't it? Instead of thinking that you're boring or you're not enough or you're whatever, you're different. That's all it is. You've got different tastes and different things. But how do you handle that in a relationship when you are, you know, extreme opposites? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's adjusting to those things. And uh, people come together because they like how each other are at that time. <laughs> and, you know, the classic thing of, oh, well, you know, I'll change them. When, when we get married or when we live together, I'll make them change. And, you know, that doesn't work. <laughs> people do adapt. And, you know, my husband and I are very different. I don't think it's particularly an introvert extrovert thing. We just we've got very different ways of thinking and, and being. But we've learned successfully because we've been together for a very long time to adapt, and we don't always agree by any means at all. <laughs> but we manage to resolve those differences uh, and make it all work. And it's partly by having very different interests, which we've always had. We do some things together, we do some things separately, which is actually quite healthy, if you ask me. Yes, yes. I mean that old sort of romantic ideal of one person being the uh, you know be able to give you everything that you need in your life you don't need any other friends or relationships of any sort is is a fairy tale basically isn't it so it's uh, having friends that can give those things that one person can't in a different range of ways is very healthy it's different roles isn't it it's different roles but yeah i mean i think you know one of the things that people also need to understand is that it's not better to be one way or the other um and you shouldn't feel that you have to be different or to change your ways. Yes, compromise is important. So, but, but both parties should recognise that they're just different and accept that instead of changing it. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's, it's just realising that that is the case. And we're, you know, we're all different places on a scale anyway, naturally, and we change in different circumstances, as you said. So you know, it's uh, recognising what you naturally like to do. Um, I know 
my sister told me that when I was a young teenager, my mother said to her, can you encourage Mary to go out more and do stuff, you know, do more things? I didn't want to. I was just happy being quiet at home with a book or going for a walk. And uh, I don't think she had much success in encouraging me to, <laughs> to go out. I, mean, I, I did later on when I got a bit older and was able to do more things and have separate friends and you know, boyfriends and all those things. Obviously, I, like most people, I got into all that and went out a lot more. I think the thing as well is that pe people do that because they feel that it's something they ought to do because they're doing it. I mean, a couple of things, personal things here. When I had a uh, nervous breakdown five years ago, you know, uh, I was very much encouraged to go out, which I tried to do, but I felt worse being surrounded by people because you make me feel worse that, I, you know, there were so many things I needed to sort out and I wasn't happy and I wasn't well and this and the other. So I chose to not go anymore because it wasn't even fair on them. I was really like, you know, the party pooper to a degree. And since then, you know, I, I've really learned to supposed to be very true to myself. So if I don't want to go somewhere, I will not go. Um, my neighbor says to me, you know, you've been preparing for safe isolation for years. And she has tried to get me out to various things. And I was like, no, I'm not interested. I'm quite happy to go for a meal. I'm quite happy to whatever, but all of these things, nah not for me but people struggle to understand that and then they start worrying about you because you're not doing what you should be doing in their eyes yes yes exactly and there's some some really good uh, introvert jokes going around at the moment aren't there <laughs> online <laughs> it's really nice to see um, if you can't laugh it's a serious situation but if you can't laugh <laughs> you think that sometimes people actually see being an introvert as a bad thing but society judges you as someone who's a bit weird because you're like a hermit. Yeah, absolutely. They certainly have in the past, haven't they? Anybody yeah. who's self-sufficient just by themselves is, is suspicious. You know, why would they not want to come out and see people? And there's, a, there's a lot of that, you know, but so many people, obviously it's always been a human trait over the years. Some people have loved to be by themselves, maybe to the extremes of totally isolating themselves as a hermit might. Um, but often in other ways, just being quiet and not mixing with people. And people have seen it, as you say, the, the predominant way of being in society. And apparently when I was researching, it was, there's actually quite an even balance in most societies of introverts and extroverts. It's just that, the, again, as I said, their business and work it tends to be set up by those who shout loudest, basically. <laughs> and, you know, there's good size we would be lost without all those extrovert tendencies to entertain us and go out and do things but also you need all those other range of people within that as well yeah and i think you know i mean there's also an element of confidence to degree what i mean by that um so as i say i don't mind being an extrovert from time to time and take over shall we say and i went to dinner in france not last week week before whenever it was with people I've either not seen since I was five years old uh, or I've not seen for a very long time. So an environment where all of a sudden I'm not a five-year-old anymore, I'm a 40-plus person, but they probably still see me as a five-year-old. And to start off with, I was extremely quiet, really. And then because of um, the way this was all going, I did take over. And I noticed I was taking over, but I think sometimes you've got to also realise when to shut up. And unfortunately, a lot of people who are extroverts don't do that, and it annoys people because we take over too much. Yes, yes, I agree. And of course, the, the issue is that everybody has different um, feelings about when that line is. So you can never please everybody, but being sensitive and... It's, it's offering... a mark of respect, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It is part of respect, offering people a chance to, <laughs> to tell you to be quiet <laughs> if they need you, to offer people that back. It's just it's, often it's people sometimes who are extroverts talk over people all the time, don't they? And interrupt you because they, you know, maybe they feel their opinion is, is better or more important <laughs> than yours because you're that quiet person who doesn't say anything very much. But the issue with that is that actually people then dismiss what they are saying because they don't feel that they have that respect and that they're not understood nor even allowed to speak, so to speak. Yes, and I'm really passionate about how much is lost in the world by quieter people not being heard. Yes. Because, because we have a different perspective 
we need both we need the whole range but the you know the extrovert louder persons is usually put out there easily whereas us quieter people it may not and we may analyze things differently we tend to listen differently we tend to draw out different things you know, and, you know when i was working full-time i get you know my manager saying to me oh why didn't you speak up we know you've got some good ideas to offer and i said well i couldn't i didn't have time you know because people rush on so quick for the next thing and the next thing and even when people were made to take turns in a meeting often i'd lost the thread by the time it got to me you know, i got better at it over time i learned these things as i was researching and reading for myself to help support myself in the world of busy work but you know, there is a lot of that and i think you know it's like any it's a diversity issue really if any of that diversity of experience and knowledge and wisdom is lost, then and the whole really, world loses something. Because you know? mm. this is the thing, we all come to our opinions through our experiences. It doesn't make our opinion better or worse than anybody else, but it is ours. And unfortunately, people always try to convince you or we actually convince you that, you know, you're right, they're wrong. Or if you voice your opinion, I mean, I had a little experience with my um, uncle where I voiced my opinion about the coronavirus and how I felt, you know, there was an element of mass manipulation by the media. And he, he, he really took it the wrong way in the sense that, um, you know, I wasn't trying to tell him he was wrong. I was just voicing my own opinion. So I had to, you know, use all my NOP skills to like show him that because basically I, I had gone about it the wrong way because of various reasons, emotions, alcohol, whatever. Um, but it, people expect that because that's what it would do anyway. Yes, yes. And it's, it's, it's something about that, uh, that being heard. You know, it's a bit like, you know, if you've never seen the world from the level of a wheelchair, you don't know what it's like, so you don't appreciate the difficulties. Or if you've never had to push somebody around, which I had to with my mother when she was in a nursing home, you know, you've, you've had to experience that. You don't know what it's like. So if people are planning buildings and entrances and all those things, and it's, it's much better now, of course, because there are laws to enforce it. But in, you know, at one time, there weren't. So if you've never seen something through somebody else's eyes, there's that old saying of, you know, until you've walked a mile in another man's shoes, you don't understand their life. I think it's, there is something about that really allowing them to be heard. So the best way to do that is to listen, because you can't literally put yourself in their shoes all the time. But you can try sitting in a wheelchair and feeling what it feels like, which I've done. Um, but it is, you know, you're never still in that person's situation, but you can at least listen compassionately and give them the time to explain what they need to. And I think all of what we just discussed also gets translated into social media because I realise um, that actually I used to post an awful lot probably when I could be have been classed as a proper extrovert where now it's very minimal. I mean, by that, for instance, on Facebook, on my own page, it's quite minimal uh, compared to where it would have been. And on my public page, it doesn't matter. But that's what I'm trying to say. I think that there's definitely different kinds of people. And I also know some introverts who posts all the time on Facebook. So is it because actually it's their way of voicing everything that they're saying to themselves in the head? Or what do you think? Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one looking at social media, isn't it? Because I, I post quite a lot, but I share photographs and things I love about nature and just, you know, just things I love. And it's partly for personal, it's partly for business. So it's a mixture for me. Um, but then, you know, I do find a, a really good example is, particularly an introvert, extrovert, but people are trying to be really helpful and sharing all this information that's coming out. But it's partly Facebook's fault by having that, that option to share in messenger instead of just on your wall but you know people who are sharing something in messenger to all their friends you keep getting all these messages well, i can i interpret messenger as something for a private direct message yeah so do i that's a communication between two people so when i keep getting reams and reams of notifications you have to actually look at them to see what they are is, yeah. and they're done with the best intentions and you know whether they, they're extrovert or introvert i don't know but it's not done with thought as to how it's going to be received and I think that's really that's one of the keys of communication, isn't it? As I talked about earlier about uh, in, in relationships of all sorts, is to just pause for a moment and see how your communication is going to be received. So whether it's an email, and that's particularly important in work, isn't it? You know, you can often fire off an email and send it, and then think, oh, <laughs> what have I done? Thing, though, with all of these things, you don't read body language. Where when it's face to face, or even like through a video conferencing platform you can still see more or less 
uh, how the other person's reacting. And yet the introvert extrovert thing is still very much valid, I think, uh, on social media, especially nowadays, especially at the moment where we can find for starters. But um, I mean, like for instance, with online dating, you know, people don't pay attention, as you say, of how whatever they're writing is going to be received because they can't see the person, they can't see the body language or none of it. No, no, exactly. And there is, you know, so sending lots and lots of messages out is almost like shouting at somebody, isn't it? It's, uh, it's an overload. And, you know, I don't know about you, I certainly find I'm staying off social media more at the moment because there's too much overload. And I don't want to see a lot of the stuff. It doesn't feel mm. helpful. <laughs> so whatever it is, whether it's good intentions or whether it's you know, spreading conspiracy theories and all sorts of things, which I don't, you know, people are entitled to believe what they believe, but I don't think it's helpful going forward. So, you know, with the basic principle of, of our work in coaching is to take people from where they are now to, to the new place, isn't it, where they want to be and to find out where they want to be, perhaps. So, you know, whether that's, whatever's happened in the past isn't helpful, what's got us to this situation now is how we respond and what we do with it and how we make it turn out as best we can for everybody in this moment. So if we turn to the introversion, extroversion thing, I think it is a real good opportunity for us to value each other so we need those extroverts who are able to go out in the world and speak and clearly and pass on the message and be, be bouncy and lively and full of energy for the rest of us who are more quiet then we also need our quietness to give them a chance to settle and i think all of it it just translates into acceptance whether of yourself or of others it does yes acceptance and respect as you said earlier respect for others and acceptance of it for both ways for ourselves and for others yeah so what, what would you say you know in terms of uh communication and all the rest of it how would you handle an introvert extrovert in a relationship what are the best ways to make it work um good question i mean it's, it's those it's honest conversations in any situation it's identifying that those are are traits that are common to lots of people there's not something wrong with me because i'm an introvert or the other person because they're an extrovert it's not there's something wrong with us it's just who we are and those things to be celebrated but also if we want to communicate clearly and have a 